As a member of the board of directors for St. Vladimir Institute, I just wanted to, uh, to say that it's a, a wonderful place uh, for any student at uh, U of T to, uh, to live, work, live, and, and raise a family. Um, it's, um, as the president of the board says, it's a retro boutique residence, student residence that serves home cooked meals. And uh, it is a wonderful place and I encourage uh, you to all to spread the good word that it's, it's a great place to, to, uh, to hang, your, hang your student's hat and, and, and live. Okay, um, more often than not, the topic of sainthood conjures up images of otherworldly people who had in their day very little to do with life on this planet. That notion easily leads into the further uh, mistaken idea that to be a saint, one would need to be divested of all but the most fundamental of human desires and needs. Uh, yet, we are all called to holiness in our vocation to participate in the body of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit and to experience what Eastern theology especially calls theosis or our personal transfiguration in the incarnate Son and Word of God. The term saint was the Apostle Paul's standard term for Christian or a follower of the way of Christ. It served to underscore the apostolic worldview or Weltanschauung that a complete and total commitment of oneself to Christ was and is a standard norm for every Christian regardless of state or position in the world. Sainthood is also an important charism of the local particular church, the manifestation of miracle working saints whose lives attested to heroism pointed to the action of the Holy Spirit not only in them but first and foremost in the churches with their respective spiritualities which nurtured and developed their saints, their particular cloud of witnesses. Saints, if you will, legitimate the way of Christ as followed by their particular churches as their first fruits manifesting the presence of the Holy Spirit evident in their internal ecclesial lives which strengthen their external witness of Christ to the world. In that vein, we can appreciate the new examples of sanctity in the life of the particular Kievan church. By Kievan church, I mean the various jurisdictions, Orthodox and Greco-Catholic, which derive their apostolic foundation from the ancient ecclesial center of Kiev, although I would like to focus mainly on Orthodox saints, both newly glorified and newly revealed. The undoubted strength of the process um, of the glorification or canonization of saints within the Orthodox tradition is how it continues to follow the once universal heritage of the undivided church in this respect. Orthodox saints continue to be glorified for purposes of liturgical veneration at the most local of levels, beginning with monasteries and villages, a practice that was in vogue in the Catholic West until Pope Urban VIII's ruling that beatification was to be decided by Rome. Although many Latin bishops continue to beatify their diocesan servants of God, um, such as uh, Blessed John Duns Scotus, the Franciscan theologian, beatified by uh, St. John Paul II, but uh, he was honored as a beatus locally uh, in Italy for decades before that, having been beatified by a local Italian bishop. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, a plethora of archaeological research has exploded onto the ecclesial scene in Ukraine, especially to determine their own spiritual roots. This has led to the discovery and study of the earliest Christians in Tauria and Crimea on the northern shores of the Black Sea, dating to before the time of Pope Saint Clement, who was martyred in its waves in 101 AD. As we know, Saint Clement was closely associated to the chief apostles Peter and Paul, being consecrated by Saint Peter himself. He wrote, I mean St. Clement, the eight books of the Apostolic Constitutions, which are still an integral part of the New Testament of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church. Composed the Liturgy of St. Clement, the Epistle of Clement to the Corinthians, and probably wrote Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews as his scribe. It was Clement who laid the solid foundations of a unified church in Tauria, and when he was martyred, his anchor, along with his relics, were highly prized and honored. St. Vladimir took this miracle-working anchor 
along with Clement's skull to Kiev after his baptism. And perhaps the most surprising recent discovery is the association of the familiar Ukrainian trident with Clement. Archaeologists have now definitively demonstrated that the trident was a form of St. Clement's anchor, a badge of belonging to the particular church he founded. Vladimir simply augmented, augmented the anchor with its cross with two Byzantine bees on either side, signifying Basilios Basilion, the, or King of Kings, taken from Constantine's imperial banner. Archaeologists continue to uncover the ruined shrines of ancient saints dotting the southern coastline. And in some cases where the names of the saints are lost, the church has entered them into her calendar as, in quote, saint whose name is known only to God. In Kiev itself, it was always assumed that the great lavra of the Kievan Caves Monastery of Saints Anthony and Theodosius with its underground caverns enshrining the relics of over 150 venerable fathers was the first monastic center following the baptism of Kiev in Rus by Saint Vladimir. In fact, we now know that even prior to this, by about 200 years, there was a thriving monastery of the Kiev Zverinetsky Caves, devastated by enemy raids. The descendant of Saint Joasaf, Bishop of Bilhrod, who would himself become a saint and hero martyr, Saint Joasaf Zhevacho, in the early part of the 20th century, began to not only promote archaeological digs on the site of these underground caves, but to also develop monastic life on the same site. We know that early saints such as Saint Leonti of Rostov and others who would go on to join the Kievan Caves Lavra were tonsured at the Zverinetsky Monastery and were trained in the ascetical practices of Eastern monastic life there. The church has formally glorified all the venerable fathers and martyrs of that monastery with an icon written to honor the almost two dozen known saints as well as the unknown martyrs. The monastery founded by the holy Saint Jonah of Kiev nearby serves to protect the grounds and shrines associated with it. The cave's lava itself bore out a number of venerable fathers whose underground relics were, un were covered by rocks and debris due to the earthquakes of history. And in many cases, just the names of the saints are known and nothing of their lives, save for the fact that they were intimately united to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are also 61 mirror-bearing skull relics of unknown venerable fathers in both the caves of Anthony and Theodosius, save for the one identified as the skull of Saint Clement the Pope, which exudes aromatic oil to this day in a silver chalice. Among the newly glorified Orthodox saints in Ukraine, there seems to be something of a competition among the jurisdictions to determine which church is more patriotic than the other within the general framework of jockeying for more members in the newly freed and nationally conscious Ukraine. St. Peter Mohila, Archimandrite of the Kiev and Kiev's Lavra and Metropolitan of Kiev, Halic and Al Rus, was glorified for his sanctity and many achievements on behalf of the Kievan church not the least of which was his work to strengthen its particular foundations. Both the Moscow and the Kiev and Orthodox jurisdictions moved in tandem to glorify him on the very same day. Another example of this is the glorification of the Cossack leader, St. Peter Kalnyshevsky, by both jurisdictions as well. The famous Manyava Sket had his founding fathers glorified, St. Job Knyahinitsky and Theodosius, while the great Ivan Vyshensky of Mount Athos, about whom the Ukrainian poet Ivan Franko wrote an extensive poem, was likewise recently glorified together with uh, all saints of the Saint Pantelimon uh, Lavra on Mount Athos, of which there are, I believe, 125 saints. Then there is the great venerable father, Saint Paisi Velichkovsky, the teacher of the Jesus Prayer, who was glorified on Athos and is now a universal Orthodox saint, well respected throughout the West, and made popular by the book The Way of the Pilgrim, where his work as a translator of spiritual literature is noted. What was quite remarkable about Saint Paisi is his charismatic personality that drew disciples to the patristic tradition of the Jesus Prayer from 10 countries. A patriotic native of Poltava, something which Saint Paisi always underscored whenever he signed his name, he fell in love with Romanian culture and learned the Romanian language as the Archimandrite at Nyams Monastery. The Paisian tradition developed the flowering of such Romanian saints as Kalinikos of Chernitsa and Saint Pachomius the Roman, 
who ended his days at the Kiev and Caves Lava. It was through St. Paisi that the Romanian Church adopted the veneration of Saints Vladimir and Olga, Boris and Halib, and the Saints of the Caves Lava to this day. Ongoing research into the extent of the spiritual influence of the Kievan Church has led to the discovery of other saints with Ukrainian connections. In 1988, the first pilgrimage to the Bavarian shrine of one Saint Edigna was made by Ukrainians. Edigna, it turned out, was actually the granddaughter of Yaroslav the Wise and the daughter of Queen Anne Yaroslavna of France. Not wishing to marry the German prince chosen for her, she retired to a hollow oak tree where she lived an anchorite's life and was glorified as a Western saint. We know that Saint Margaret, Queen of Scotland, was likewise a granddaughter of Yaroslav the Wise, whose father, King Malcolm Canmore, sought and received protection against his political enemies in Kiev, where Margaret grew up. Glorifications of similar royal holy persons have taken place as if to assert the right of the particular Church of Kiev to handle its own internal matters without the intrusion of external patriarchates. Yaroslav the Wise, together with his brother Sudislav, uh, Vladimir II, Monomach, and others have been glorified. In Monomach's case, he married the daughter of King Harold of England, Gaida, following the Battle of Hastings. Their son received two names in baptism, Stislav and Harold, after his English grandfather. The Scandinavian sagas only refer to St. Stislav as Harold. Glorified, too, was the first Christian ruler of Kiev and Rus. Saint Askold. It was previously thought there were two rulers named Askold and Dir, but this was an error based on the full Arabic name Askold Abdir. It was Saint Askold who went to war with Byzantium and witnessed the miracle of the protective veil of the Virgin Mary, which saw the destruction of many ships of his fleet. He sued for peace and entered into negotiations with the great Saint Photius, Patriarch of Constantinople who sent with him the missionaries St. Cyril and Methodius. It was at this moment of history in the ninth century that the first baptism of Kiev and Rus took place with the establishment of Ukraine's firm veneration of the protective veil of the Mother of God. In the east, the vast areas of Siberia were Christianized by scholars of the Kiev and Mohila Academy, such as St. John Maximovich, the Metropolitan of Toborsk, who translated also the liturgy into Chinese. His 20th century descendant, also St. John Maximovich, Archbishop of Shanghai, served that liturgy in the Chinese language and built two Orthodox churches in Shanghai. A Chinese consul general whom I met at Queen's Park assured me that both churches are still standing. And the more than 200 glorified Chinese new martyrs, um, Chinese Orthodox new martyrs of the Boxer Rebellion in 1900, are also the fruit of the Ukrainian missionary efforts there. The indigenous saints of Siberia had their cultus brought back to Kiev and throughout Russia by those same missionaries such as St. Paul Konyuskevich of Tobolsk from Galicia, St. Sofroni Kristalsky, a professor at the uh, uh, Mohila Academy, St. Innocent Kruczycki, uh, a poet, and the great St. Theophil Leszczynski, the apostle of Siberia, who built more than 2,500 uh, 2, churches throughout Siberia. The missionary reach of the Kievan church extended into Alaska with St. Herman and St. Innocent of Alaska took that name in monasticism because he desired to pattern his life after that of the Siberian missionary Innocent Kruczewski. The patron saint of New York City is the new hiero martyr St. Alexander Hotovitsky, uh, an ethnic Ukrainian who worked there before returning home to the outbreak of the Bolshevik Revolution. Many new martyrs and confessors of Ukraine were glorified in the year 2000 such as the 17 venerable martyrs of Mahar Monastery, where is buried also the, the sitting patriarch, St. Athanasius the Sitting, who was um, uh, enshrined there, uh, sitting on his uh, patriarchal throne. The 103 hero martyrs of Cherkass, uh, priests who were forced to kneel before a massive grave and were asked the question, is there a god? With a rifle uh, pointing at their heads, and every time they said, yes, there is, and they were shot in the nape of the neck and thrown into this massive grave, um, and many others. In that year was glorified also Saint Arseny Matsievich, Metropolitan of Rostov of the 18th century, who for his opposition to the rule of the state over the church was walled up in a fortress tower 
where he died of maltreatment. He was the one who began the canonization proceedings for Saint Dimitri of Rostov, the great uh, translator and writer of the lives of the saints. Um, it was actually common among Russian aristocrats to build small copies of this same tower on their expansive estates as a way to honor Saint Arseny, um, to whom was uh, noted more than 200 uh, official miracles by the Synod of Russia. Recent glorifications include that of Saint Paul of Taganrog, a lay laborer who lived a very, very simply and uh, a very simple and spiritual life which attracted people to seek him out for his counsel and prayerful intercession. The Holy Fathers of the Hlinsk Hermitage have been glorified, who together with the Fathers of Optina stood in the Paisian tradition of Hesychasm, based on the Jesus prayer and the patristic spiritual tradition, especially exemplified by the teaching of St. Gregory Palamas, whose feast day is coming up on the second Sunday of Lent coming up. In Kiev, a fool for Christ's sake, St. John the Barefoot was glorified last year, a man who collected resources to feed and clothe hundreds of people daily, but who himself did not own a pair of shoes. The other great fool for Christ's sake was St. Theophilus of the Key of Caves, whose own mother tried to drown him not once but three times in the Dnieper River. He became a monk who prayed for hours in a hollow oak tree, um, and he also covered himself with honey so that the insects of the air would sting his flesh as a form of mortification. Uh, he was able to read the thoughts of those who came to him for advice. He rode around Kiev in a cart pulled by an ox, reading the Psalms, collecting food, which he then distributed to the poor. And once Philaret, the Metropolitan of Kiev, was saying his morning prayers, but then didn't finish them because he was late for an appointment. So he got into his um, wagon, and as he rode, he looked up and saw Theophilus sitting on a branch of a horse chestnut tree, praying the Psalms. He stopped and shouted out, Theophilus, what in heaven's name are you doing up there? Well, said the monk, I was climbing up this tree, uh, your eminence, when I realized I had forgotten to finish my morning prayers. So I decided to continue with them during my climb. Yes, yes, you are talking about me, said the Metropolitan. Get down here so you can ride with me and we will pray together. That same Metropolitan, inspired by St. Theophilus, died a monastic at the Key of Caves Lavra and is today, today known as St. Philaret. It was the Ukrainian Catholic Metropolitan, the Venerable Andrew Sheptitsky, who deeply appreciated the Eastern Christian love for the local saints of the various particular Eastern churches. When the Russian Catholic Orthodox Church, Sikh, that's how they refer to themselves as, was formed at the beginning of the 20th century, it was Blessed Andrew who petitioned Rome to allow the new Russian Catholics to continue venerating liturgically all of their saints, and this permission was granted in 1904. The descendant of St. Paisi Velichkovsky, blessed new hero martyr Vasil Velichkovsky of Winnipeg, wrote in his mission diary that wherever, whenever an Orthodox parish came into communion with Rome in Volin, he always insisted that they continue venerating their local Orthodox saints as they had always done. I like to think that all of these saints are the common spiritual patrimony of the entire Ukrainian spiritual tradition, as well as of all Eastern and Western Christians. In particular, I'm, I, I think of uh, Father Jonah of Odessa, Saint Jonah of Odessa, who died in 1924. A married priest, he was an orphan, but he had children and, as a married priest, and he took up the, the uh, very, very specific Ukrainian tradition of praying akathists all night during the all night vigil. So he would get up at midnight to do the midnight hour, the nocturnal hour, and then he would pray akathists until uh, more, uh, daybreak. And with this type of prayer, um, he also taught other people to pray this way. And with this type of prayer, he could heal people of blindness, as well as, uh, as, well as other ailments. The chief ophthalmologist in Moscow, when asked what his main method was for for curing uh, uh, serious eye problems, he said, oh, I, that's easy, Father Jonah of Odessa. And um, there was a seven-year-old uh, boy who uh, was blind from birth. At the age of seven, his mother went to Moscow, and that same ophthalmologist with his team of uh, eye doctors said, it is impossible, we cannot do anything for your son, I'm very sorry, madam. And she said, I'm going to Father Jonah, he said he would do something. So Father Jonah brought his uh, little glass of water, his uh, book of Akathis, and he stood over the sleeping child uh, every night, all night, 
uh, for nine nights straight. On the morning of the 10th day, the child woke up and could see 2020 vision. All of Odessa rejoiced. And the communists arrested him, saying that this was, uh, this was trickery. And uh, he, he was put into uh, prison. But then the chief ophthalmologist uh, himself came from Moscow to defend Father Jonah. He said, you don't understand. This man really is a miracle worker. And he, he defended him so zealously that the communists took their anger out on the ophthalmologist and released Father Jonah. Father Jonah died in peace, and uh, his grave immediately, like, like that, those of many other elders and sainted elders, became a place of pilgrimage. And uh, I was recently contacted by a group of Romanian Orthodox Christians who are writing an extensive book uh, on his life as well. And, and that's who I think of whenever I think of uh, the, some of the, the holy persons, holy people uh, of uh, the Kievan Church of Ukraine. And they are so important to us because they, they teach us how to pray. Um, today, for example, we commemorate St. Cyril, the equal to the apostles, and the 12 holy Greek architects who built the foundations of the Kievan Caves Lavra, St. Isaac of the Kievan Caves, and the translation of the relics of the royal martyrs, St. Michael, and his boyar, St. Theodore of Chernihiv. I believe that at this time, when the Eastern Catholic churches are reclaiming their ancient traditions and rites, as St. John Paul the Great himself encouraged us to do, one of those traditions must surely be the right of our particular churches to glorify their own saints for their own liturgical veneration. Um, and as well as, if I may uh, make an even bolder suggestion, the right to so venerate the saints glorified by our sister Orthodox churches. They are all part of the great cloud of witnesses that speak to theosis achieved and who remind us all that the same grace of the Holy Spirit that was open to them is also open to us each within the particular circumstances of our various life vocations. In this respect, the example of St. Paul of Taganrod speaks very loudly. A man with no clerical or mon monastic status, whatever, a humble laborer who earned his daily bread with the sweat of his brow and who in his poverty shared his meager earnings with the poor. He rose to the heights of sanctity. This sanctity is especially enunciated in the teaching of the Kievan Church with regards to the fulfillment of the admonishment to us to pray without ceasing. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen, and thank you for your attention.